Good evening and a very warm welcome to First Issues. They say a diamond is forever, but we are very aware that diamond mines are not. For decades, Botswana has spoken of developing multiple industries and exports to help cushion the economy when diamond production and prices are low. Industries to help absorb the hundreds and thousands of unemployed Botswana that mining clearly cannot employ. And to help protect the health of the economy once the country has completely exhausted its diamond reserves. An eventuality that some experts say is less than 20 years away. If nothing is done in that time, the country will lose 80% of its export earnings and government half of its revenue. For decades, we have mulled over this over-dependency on diamonds. Conversations, news articles, seminars and projects consistently speak of economic diversification, but little seems to have been implemented. We therefore elevate our concerns to the World Bank's Vice President for Africa, Makta Diop, to hear what one of the world's largest sources of funding and knowledge for developing countries thoughts are on this matter. He says along with providing the best research and practices from the world of academia and the private sector, the World Bank can help the government of Botswana with the necessary tools to foster the mindset change and good governance necessary for the country to achieve the diversification goals set out in the National Development Plan 11. We discuss uh, possibility of cooperation in uh, helping, uh, for instance, the, the, the training of civil servants to increase the efficiency of government in some areas that have been identified by the, by the government. We were, we were even talking about possibility of working with the school of civil service to see how we can bring. Let me tell you the kind of things that we could bring in that conversation. If you take, for instance, people who were trained in civil service 20 years ago, they are not necessarily familiar with things like public-private partnership because at that time it was not something which was, uh, which was really a uh, mainstream activity. If you take, for instance, uh, uh, engaging with the private sector, uh, uh, seeing the new, the new opportunity and the new way of doing business with the private sector, to develop this close relation, this is something that if you are not, uh, uh, if you have been, been trained in that way, it is difficult to perceive and to, to be receptive to that uh, interaction. If you look at some of the other techniques that are now developed in procurement, in financial management, which makes uh, procurement of government much faster to improve the value for money of public investment, we will not be able to achieve the objectives that have been set by the government in the National Development Plan. So investing in uh, continuously uh, improving the training, the exposure of, of civil servants, uh, is something important if you want to implement your programs at the pace that have been defined by the government. The second one is to continue, uh, because that's the work that you ne will never end, continue on the, on the governance side. And Botswana has been one of the leading countries in Africa on uh, having good governance. So uh, continue that, that excellent effort of really making sure that there is no corruption, that uh, uh, people are following due processes, this will be essential in continue building the trust and confidence uh, in, in Botswana. What are the lessons for Botswana in terms of what has worked, um, the parallels, are there countries in a similar position, and of course the mistakes that have been made in terms of economic diversification. What should Botswana keep in mind along this journey? Uh, many are frustrated that it's been a term that's been thrown around for quite some time and they aren't really seeing um, much happen in this space. Diversifying an economy is not an easy exercise. Let's take a country like Chile, which has been uh, 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 the main export, one of the main exporters of copper, and uh, which has been having a good, good macroeconomic policies like uh, Botswana. So they are moving in, uh, in the, pro they are uh, uh, trying to diversify the economy, but it takes time. And this country has been started the process well before uh, Botswana. If you take uh, uh, Nordic country which were oil exporters in the past and the, it, take, it took a lot of time for them to start really transforming their economy and moving from oil export to 
uh, an economy which is more linked to biotechnology, to nanotechnology. It took a little bit of time. And, uh, and they had a better uh, 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 initial conditions. They had a, a better, uh, a more educated labor force. They had a mo they are more integrated to some of the, of the markets. They, are, they had uh, some proximity with more important markets. So it takes time. Uh, but what can we do to accelerate that process? That's what I think is important. What we can do is take up the opportunity offered by this technological revolution. So today, we can use IT to leapfrog in some areas instead of following the steps that were done. To be able to invest in, 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 in areas that are not only important for today, but for the market of tomorrow. We, we often uh, uh, the, uh, are tempted in investing in what works today and say I will compete only on the market of today. But it's important also to invest in, to, in, in tomorrow. The, the, the 3D revolution that we are seeing in machinery is creating new opportunities in some, in, in some areas that we might want to seize and use to, to our profit. So I, th I, will, I will just recommend to be consistent in, in what you are doing, very consistent. Uh, not to have stop and goes, and I think Botswana has been quite consistent, to be agile, because that is very important. In this world, if you are not agile, opportunity come and go very, 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 very fast. So you, it's important to create the condition that your labor force, your institution, uh, are able to adapt quickly to the new condition uh, of, of the market. Third, to not to look at only the traditional markets, to look at different markets. You have new opportunity, you have Asia, you have China, which are growing very fast. What, look at what is one or two niches in those markets that uh, 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 Botswana can seize. And a small share of this huge market makes a huge difference in a country like, like, like Botswana. So having your eyes and ears everywhere to see what can be seized as an opportunity, but to react very quickly when those opportunities are, are, are before you. A public service that encourages public-private partnerships would be an exciting development. Welcome back to First Issues as we continue to look at the World Bank's recommendations for the acceleration of economic diversification in Botswana. Mr. Diop recently signed off on a 145.5 million US dollar loan to the Republic of Botswana from the World Bank for the emergency water security and efficiency project that is to benefit over 630,000 Botswana. Despite similar examples of the World Bank's work across the globe, there is a persistent perception that these type of loans allow the bank to exert a certain level of influence over governments in the developing world. Is this a perception that Mr. Diop encounters in his work on the continent? And how does he go about clarifying the role of the World Bank to the communities he interacts with? My own experience. I was uh, working in government in my own countries. I didn't spend all my life at the World Bank. Mm. So I was at the other side of the table. Uh, I will certainly never accept that uh, uh, any other institution and come and tell us what you have to do or not to do. It was a balanced dialogue, at least that's what I believe that it was. Uh, and uh, uh, I, African countries and African policy makers have demonstrated their ability to implement, to, de to design their own policy, to implement it. That's the very reason why the World Bank moved to conditionalities, that's what we are doing in the 80s, to now programs where we don't have conditionalities, where we say to the country, implement your policies and uh, we will work with you in, implement, in, uh, in bringing you the financial support and financial needs. Uh, one of the things that we are doing, we, during our biannual meetings, uh, uh, during the spring and uh, during the fall, uh, we have a lot of delegation coming to, uh, to Washington. And increasingly, they bring with them member of parliament, and actually sometimes member of the opposition, to witness our interaction with uh, policymakers in, uh, in Africa. And uh, 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 consistently after those meetings, I have a chat with those members of the opposition. And they're extremely surprised with the tone and the way we are talking to each other and they say, we thought that it was just a, a, a different type of relation. It was, was a one-way conversation, but in fact, it's a very balanced conversation. When I go back home, I will explain to my colleague MPs 
that in fact is not what we are reading the newspaper about the World Bank role that is, is true. So a lot of this needs to be done and continue to be done to make sure that uh, people understand clearly our role. Usually when I go to countries, I also take the time to meet with the non-governmental organization to hear them. And more and more we would like to involve them in the monitoring and the implementation of the project. Because at the end of the day, it's not the project of the World Bank or the project of one or two officials. It's a project which benefits the people of the country. So we would like to have as many people involved in the process so that they can guide us, they can correct, they can help us to improve the, 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 the implementation of this project and create uh, the, this feedback loop that is necessary, especially coming from the for the population. Let's continue the conversation on economic diversification on our social media platforms. Up next, however, we get a look into the magazine industry with the managing editor of Forbes Africa magazine, Chris Bishop. Welcome back to First Issues. For years, academics have deliberated over the potential impact of the internet on traditional media. In my years as a mass communication student, we read differing views as to whether the convergence of print and video with digital platforms would completely annihilate books, magazines, newspapers, and even television as we know it. The threat seemed very real and very imminent. Those who advocated for the staying power of print argued that consumers will always have a better emotional connection with the more tangible platform. That we are more likely to value and keep a letter from a loved one than an email or a text. That you are more likely to pay attention to a glossy magazine advert than a blinking online one. It appears they may have been onto something. Magazines, which are publications that were first mentioned over 280 years ago, seem to have more staying power than the electronic tablet, for one. And findings by the United States Consumers Association of Magazine Media have shown that although audiences continue to rapidly increase their consumption of magazine media content on mobile devices, print has maintained a relatively steady audience size. And on the other side of the world, the Times of India has become the largest circulation English language newspaper, and the value of the Indian newspaper industry is said to have grown by two thirds in the past six years. African Business News, the owners of the CNBC Africa brand, evidently believe there's a future for print as well. The company spent three years in negotiations to secure a contract with the internationally renowned Forbes magazine and were eventually able to launch Forbes Africa in October 2011. The managing editor of the publication, Chris Bishop, readily claims that the magazine is now the leading publication on the continent the biggest read business magazine on the continent, 200,000 readers every month. How did you do that? Seeing the stories behind the headlines, it's not just doing knee-jerk stories, seeing uh, stories that people really wanted about what was going on on the ground, that's number one. I think number two, getting assembling a team of young, hard-working and idealistic journalists who are prepared to work hard, um, who are prepared to get out and get those stories. I think first-hand eyewitness accounts is one of our strengths. Uh, the credibility we have, I mean, no one reads any stories uh, in our newsroom except for us. We have complete uh, independent autonomy when it comes to telling stories, which is always a good thing for a publication if you want people to believe you. Uh, there's a lot of appetite for it. I, I said when we launched five years ago, well, it was five years ago on October the 1st we launched, the launch in Johannesburg, I said I thought that um, business was the new rock and roll of Africa. And I think it is. I think that everyone wants to talk about it. I mean, when I first came to this continent, people were still talking about post-liberation politics and conflicts and wars and whatever. But now people want to talk about business. There's a lot of interest in it. And I think what the internet has done and what the uh, sort of almost like globalization has done is that made, they've shown people that you can do it. 
You said off camera, actually, that getting somebody on the cover of Forbes magazine, somebody would assume um, people are fighting and jostling to be on there and because it's such a prestigious thing, but you have found it to be quite the challenge. Well, it's quite interesting, actually, because the people who are fighting to get on are usually the people that we wouldn't look at. You know, we don't do CEOs. A lot of people are surprised by that. We don't do CEOs. We don't do people who've got jobs, if you know what I'm saying. We don't do... Um, DJs and sports people, we don't do people like that. But there's the strict rules that we have. Number one, you have to be an entrepreneur. You have to have risked your own money. Number two, you have to have minimum wealth. I mean, we're talking about three to four hundred million dollars net personal wealth, which again, rules out a lot of people. Three, you have to have a story to tell. We always like to do people on the cover when they're doing business or expanding. I mean, the recent one we had in Botswana here, Mr. Odopatu, I mean, he was looking to expand across sub-Saharan Africa. He just listed on the stock exchange. He, his business was happening at that time. It was good to talk to him. Four, we like people that uh, people really want to hear from, like him, like the Oppenheimers we've had. We've had Aliko Dangote, the richest man in Africa. We've had Patrice Motsepe, closer to home. People who really want to get a uh, hold of uh, and listen to what they say. Those are the ones we specialize in. Uh, also, you have to be a person of standing and of substance. You know, we always avoid people who um, have merely what they are because of political connections. We always try to avoid people who, uh, we always try to make sure that there's absolutely, whoever we do, they're an upstanding person and someone that be, can be respected. And also the last thing we need is somebody who's known of beyond borders. Um, one of the great problems we had in the early days is that you'd have somebody who'd be a, a massive name in West Africa and here people would say, who's that? Mm. But uh, on the other side, uh, same thing the other way around. You know, people in West Africa haven't heard of the millionaires here. But I think one thing we've done with Forbes Africa, I mean, my wife, she's a, a financial journalist, and she said to me, one of the things that you've done, you've created um, our own household names. All these years, we've been talking about Richard Branson and yes. talking about Donald Trump or whatever, is, but you've create, made the billionaires and millionaires of Africa household names. And I think that's something that uh, helps me go to sleep at night um, very soundly. The criteria alone would make somebody wonder, how do you find people on the continent month after month? I think it has given us a brand new respect for the faces we see on the Well, that's the thing. And, 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 and sometimes people say, oh, you know, this guy's a small guy. Why don't you put him on, etc." But the same people who say that, mm. who want us to put sort of um, odd people on the cover, are the same people who would be the first to hand us the magazine and say, who on earth is this? Mm. I don't know him. Why am I looking at him, you see? And that's the point, you see. People say one thing they like, because what a lot of magazines do, they, they run through the, the obvious people, they run through the people who everybody knows, and then they lose, uh, run out of ideas, and they start putting anybody they can get, which is not what we do. We always try to work, um, ideally, I'd love to work six months ahead, mm -hmm. but at least three or four months ahead. So if anything happens along the way, I mean, things happen. I mean, the other day, the current um, cover, we've got uh, Richard Maponia. I mean, he's 96 years of age. He's a massive name in, in Southern Africa. Uh, he's got a great business story to tell, but I mean, he's 96 years of age. And the, the night before we were going to interview him, um, the first time, he, he fell ill and he said, sorry, he couldn't do it. So then we had to think again. We had to pull in another cover. So that's the reason why we work ahead. Sometimes um, a lot of the entrepreneurs are quite reclusive. They, you know, they keep themselves to themselves. Some people don't want to talk. Some people, uh, you know, worried about the tax man or worried someone's going to write them begging letters or something or they want to be low profile. But the ones who do come are fascinating enough. Mr. Bishop says while they have acknowledged the times by recently making the magazine fully available online, they still strongly believe in the future of Forbes Africa in its physical form. See, Forbes Africa is one of those magazines. It's, it's, I don't know, it's a lot more than just a magazine. You know, it's, it's got that kind of, people like to be seen with it. And the people who read us, the, the top business types, the top politicians, a lot of people read it. And if anything, um, I've probably had more feedback from Forbes Africa than any other publication I've worked for in nearly 36 years of journalism. People do read it and it's got tremendous. I mean, people ask me stories about something I wrote two years ago. They'll ask me about it and I'll say, yeah, you know, whatever on the internet and I'll say, fine. But I think that the print version, I think it's still got legs. I think maybe another five, maybe 10 years. We don't know. I mean, a lot of people said by now, 
print would have gone completely. Yes. And yet, you go into any magazine store, you'll see half a, you know, half a acre of um, magazine space still. People are still buying it. But I think it's like anything. I think there'll always be a room for good magazines that people want to read. Always, I think. And that's the thing what we have to do with, with quality. We have to keep up quality. Quality of our images, we're very strict about that. Because you can't start downgrading your images as a cost issue, whatever. You have to make sure that absolutely top line images, it's top line stories, and everything is credible and checked and balanced. And uh, that's what I think makes Forbes Africa a strong publication. I do think you're doing very important work. Uh, we have had talk about how there's very little trade and exchange between African countries. And I do think it's because uh, many African countries don't know enough about each other. Um, we know more about the West and other places than we do about. So getting this type of dialogue, getting to know um, the players in different regions, I think that is a very healthy conversation. Well, what my dream having. was at the beginning mm. was I thought, I thought about it and I thought, well, what could we bring to people that they haven't got already? What could we do? And I thought, if I could get somebody in Lagos to pick up a Forbes Africa and read about somebody in Johannesburg or Khabarone and take an idea from them and learn something from them and vice versa, someone in Harare to read about somebody in Accra and Ghana and think, ah, oh, that's a good idea. What about this? The number of letters I've had from people saying, I was just about to give my business up. And I read your magazine about some guy who was struggling because that's it. We, we don't, everyone thinks all oh, you guys just talk about success and money. We don't. We talk about the struggles and the dirty side of business as well. I mean, I mean, there's a piece going into the next issue about a guy who's come up with a very successful fast food business in, in South Africa. And before then, he went bankrupt. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the people came around his house to repossess everything. And he said at that time he helped them put it in the <laughs> in the van because he was so and all he got left was a painting which they allowed him to keep he pleaded with them and they said oh, okay if you like it it's fine so he had an empty house and a painting and now he's back kicking he's got a business that's worth six or seven million dollars uh, these are the stories that people like and i think again in you leave few footprints in life but if you can say i've created a publication that's changed people's lives and therefore change other things for the better are there I, I think you can stand by that and say, well, that's my legacy. Thank you for tuning in to our program this evening. As we have said before, we are giving away double tickets to the West Bank Botswana International Air Show to viewers who like, comment on and share the most current video of our program posted on the First Issues Facebook page. Congratulations to Detroit Monghae, Thabo Moremi, and Timothy Jimmy Seda, who are the lucky winners from last week. We will be contacting you very soon. Just like, comment, and share tonight's episode, and you could win yourself double tickets to the show as well. With that, it's good night from me, Namisa Samakula, and the First Issues crew. We'll see you this Saturday at the West Bank Botswana International Air Show.